Good morning and welcome to a very special discussion, Ukraine, past, present and future. The Emil A. and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University has worked in partnership with the Babin Yar Memorial Center to pull together a powerful group of speakers today. Along with our sponsors are the Association of Holocaust Organization, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, Jewish Gen, and the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. We will spend the next hour discussing the background and current situation in Ukraine. Unfortunately, due to personal reasons, President Alexander Kvashnevsky could not join, join us this morning. We hope to connect with him later as the situation in Ukraine evolves and hear his unique perspective about it at another time. It is the goal of this program to explore the war in Ukraine in a broad historical and geopolitical context. We're hoping to hear an inside perspective about the war and gain a deeper insight on the situation in Ukraine, the war, the future of Europe, and by extension, the future of the entire free world. And we'll do so from both the professional and the lay leadership of the Babinyar Memorial Center in Kiev. My name is Dr. Shai Pilnik. I am the director of the Emile and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University. Let me now introduce our panelists. Nathan Sharansky is the chairman of the supervisory board at the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center. Born in Ukraine, Mr. Sharansky was a spokesman for the human rights movement, a prisoner of Zion and the leader in the struggle for the right of Soviet Jews to immigrate to Israel. After his arrest, conviction and incarceration in the Gulag, massive public campaigns by the state of Israel, world Jewry and leaders of the, of the free world facilitated Mr. Sharansky's release in 1986 when he made Aliyah. Mr. Sharansky served in four successive Israeli governments as minister and deputy minister. In 2018, he received the highest Israeli award, the Israel Prize for promoting Aliyah and the ingathering of the exiles. Mr. Sharansky is the recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor in 1986 and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2006. He is the only living non-American citizen who is the recipient of these two highest American awards. Between 2009 and 2018, Nathan Sharansky served as chairman of the executive of the Jewish Agency for Israel. After his retirement, he continues to serve as the chairman of the Shlichut Institute, which he founded. In July of 2019, Mr. Sharansky became the chair of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. Mr. Wuslan Kavatsuk is the deputy CEO for Sciences and Education at the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center former advisor to Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine for European and, and, and Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine, an advisor to Chief of General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine between 2015 and 2017. Mr. Kavatsuk graduated from the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, specializing in theology. I would like to thank my fellow moderators who are joining me today. My fellow moderators are Mark Weitzman, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the World Jewish Restitution Organization. Previously, he was the Director of Government Affairs for, for the Simon Wiesenthal Center. He is a member of the official U.S. delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Authority, the IRA, where he chaired the Committee on Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial and the Working Group on Holocaust Museums and Memorials. He is also a member of the Organizing Committee for the Babin Yar Memorial Center. Kelly Zaini is the Vice President of Education and Exhibitions at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. In this role, Zaini provides strategic leadership and planning for educational initiatives and exhibits. She was previously the Director of Education at the museum. I would like now to turn, I would like now to introduce my colleague, Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, the President of Yeshiva University. Rabbi Berman, I wanted to thank you for joining us today and for offering us some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pilnick. Thank you so much for organizing this and for your incredible work at the Emil and Jenny Fish Center uh, for Holocaust Studies at Yeshiva University. It's, it's definitely a, a privilege for us to be able to partner with the Babinyar uh, Memorial Center and to have such illustrious uh, guests and moderators uh, for this very important uh, discussion. Uh, of course, what's being spoken about is at the forefront of everyone's mind right now. Um, and uh, to uh, put into context and to understand deeper both the uh, causes and consequences of where we're in. Now, I just wanted to supply just to, to open with a little bit um, of a sense of personal responsibility about where we are right now. And, 
and certainly fittingly, that's right before we read the story of Purim uh, and uh, Megillat Esther uh, that we're about to get to in a couple of days. You know, and the, and the key scene, the key moment, I feel, in, uh, in the Purim story, which is really one of the key moments or key verses in all of, uh, in all of the Bible, is when Mordechai comes to Esther and he tells her that the Jewish people are in trouble you need to get involved. You need to do something about it. And interestingly, Esther first says, no. She says, it's too risky. If I get involved, everyone knows you have to be called in front of the king. If you're not called in front of the king and you show, show up, you know, you're liable to be killed. And then Mordechai says back to Esther some of the most important uh, uh, words that we see in history. And he says, Al tedami beit mikol hayudim. He says, don't think, Esther, that you are going to save yourself in the palace at this time. Because if you're quiet at this moment, Esther, now if you stop right here and you think about what will Mordechai say, Esther, if you're quiet at this moment, he should say something like, we're all going to be killed. It will be terrible. It's a terrible situation. How could you do that? He doesn't say that. He says, if you're quiet at this moment, He said, if you're quiet at this moment, salvation will come for the Jewish people from some other place. And you and your father's house will be lost. And who knows if you reach this place in the palace for this very time. And what does he mean that Esther will be lost? If the Jewish people will be saved, what does he mean that Esther will be lost? And what Mordechai is expressing is that when it comes to Jewish history, we know that in the end we'll win. We know in the end that the Jewish people will survive. Salvation will come. We know that. The question isn't whether Jewish history is at risk, Esther. The question is, what will your part be in the story? You have an opportunity, you have a moment to write yourself into the story. And if you take that moment, then you'll be remembered. And if you don't, then you'll be lost. And who knows that if you reach this point in your life, in this palace, in this position, for this moment in history, to respond to the call of history. And I think that when you, you look at the situation in Ukraine and world history, this is a moment. This is a moment where it's not just about the fate of the world, it's about ourselves. What, were our, what will our role be in the story of humanity? What will our response be? Will we write ourselves into this story? And one of the gifts about this morning is that we have with us uh, people uh, like Ruslan, who has dedicated his life uh, in the Babinyar Memorial Center to ensure that our history is remembered and to write himself into that story. And now sitting in Ukraine and the pressures that he's under to give us of his time and to continue his work at this time, you know, is a great expression of someone who's living uh, these values. And we're in the presence of Natan Sharansky, perhaps the greatest ex example uh, in our generation of someone who's who with a moral clarity, you know, not just responds to the call of history, but makes sure that we all respond to the call. You know, and I think this is one of those, those moments. And that's why it's such an honor to host this for the Yeshiva University uh, to participate with the Bob and Yair Memorial Center, uh, because we're calling on all of our students, our community, our, you know, the broader world to be involved and to do something about it. You know, just this week, we're sending students to Vienna to help with the refugees, because it's not enough to talk about it and to send charity you know, you have to show up, you have to be there. You know, so we're, we're, we're thinking a lot about what we need to be doing at this moment. And having events like this is certainly, you know, part of uh, the, our broader sense of responsibility. So I thank all of the panelists, all the people who are here joining in the audience and, 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 and really beg them to think about not just what's happening, but what's your role gonna be in what's happening and how are we going to help move the story forward in a positive and peaceful way with care and love and compassion, which is what our tradition is all about. So thank you so much. 
President Berman, thank you for these um, thought-provoking uh, reflections. I would like now to begin a discussion by taking us from the long-standing historical and theological realm all the way down to the ground. And we will begin with Ruslan. Um, Ruslan, out of all the participants in this room, you are the only one who is calling us from Western Ukraine. You left your home in Kiev um, a few weeks ago, I believe, Ruslan, as soon as the war broke out. Um, is that correct? Well, yes, I actually was uh, the day before the war started, I was in Israel and I meant to stay there for another week, but I felt that there was a high risk of war. And I took uh, and I changed my flight and I uh, took uh, the earliest flight I could back to Ukraine to my family. And it appeared uh, later that it was the last uh, day I could fly back. So uh, the next morning we woke up with the rockets hitting our town near Kyiv because I live in the suburb of the city. Uh, the town is uh, Hostomel. It's um, the town that is currently occupied by Russian forces. I yesterday, my neighbors uh, got out of uh, basically imprisonment uh, in, in that uh, area. And uh, they shared that uh, all of our homes uh, where uh, 36 homes in, in this area were blown up and uh, the rest of those that were blown up were completely robbed and, uh, and uh, now Russian soldiers live there. So I think I'm uh, officially homeless now. And, um, but uh, on the other hand, I'm thankful that uh, God uh, helped me understand the risk and I flew back and uh, that meant that I could take my wife and my two children on the first day of war and uh, drive them uh, to more safe area. And uh, I am now uh, focused on uh, uh, the way to, to be useful to my people and my country in this uh, terrible war. Ruslan, what's happening right now? Today, I believe, is the 18th day or the 19th day of the war. Um, what's happening right now, if you can give us uh, just an update? about the situation and, and the war as it evolves? So uh, there are, uh, the first uh, days of war were very uh, quick and violent. Uh, and uh, it seems that our armed forces were well prepared to meet Russians. So uh, I see that there was basically equipment uh, and uh, tanks um, destroyed that are bigger than uh, three German armies at the moment. And uh, we've uh, had um, a lot of uh, Russian soldiers uh, out of the battlefield. And um, they, however, succeeded uh, on the south, uh, getting into Kherson uh, region out of Crimea and uh, encircling, almost encircling Mariupol is the city on Azov, uh, and uh, this is a half a million city of people, and uh, this city is heavily bombarded, and they do not allow civilians out, and they bombard civilian infrastructure, like hospitals and, uh, and uh, schools, and uh, a lot of, um, we have uh, kind of a pitch, like a ravine, uh, we see it, that it was dig out uh, in the city, and more than 2,000 people are in one grave right now, with their bodies lying next to each other. If you look at the pictures, it uh, does remind you a lot of the Second World War. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is happening at, at the moment um, in Europe and, uh, and the world is, uh, is helpless uh, to stop this. And uh, near Kyiv, um, Kyiv is a big European city like uh, Warsaw or uh, like uh, you know, Budapest is no different. Uh, Ukraine is, is quite, uh, used to be quite a wealthy country. Like two weeks ago, we were, two and a half weeks ago, we were quite okay. And uh, at the moment, uh, they, they, um, they uh, blew up uh, infrastructure of, uh, of our country for hundreds of billions of dollars. And uh, they keep destroying it every day, like today in the morning. There was a 30 rockets uh, hitting Lviv region where I am right now um, and killing, uh, killing dozens of, uh, of uh, sleeping uh, soldiers in, um, in the training center and uh, hundreds are wounded. 
and uh, that is attack on the military infrastructure and uh, the attacks in, in Kyiv and uh, in Chernihiv and in Mykolaiv today were attacks on uh, civil infrastructure. So every day we have uh, uh, a lot of people uh, in need. Um, we try to help as much as we can. We try to help um, uh, people who are wounded to get out of the area that where they were um, hit. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because Russians cannot win this war by military forces, they terrorize our people. They do not let, let out uh, wounded people out of the area. And uh, like near my house, right next to my home, um, on the road that I take every day to, to, to take my children to school and kindergarten, um, my neighbor went out uh, two days ago and he filmed with his mobile phone and he dropped into our, our um, group in social media of our neighbors where we share news. He dropped this video and you see that there is a civilian car hitting uh, that hit uh, off the road, hit the tree. And there is a woman uh, like 20 years old and a young guy like 20 years old, both shot numerous shots in their heads. Blo bleeding, I can show it to you right now if you would like, but I wouldn't um, because this is one of many examples and he's filming them closely so that any of their relatives would understand that their loved ones are dead like this so that they would know what happened to them because they were trying to flee and Russians just killed them. We have cases, another neighbor of mine, uh, they were running away and uh, in front of them, there was a car with seven women and they all were stopped and those seven women were shot with children. I don't understand this violence. I don't understand the, the, the necessity of it. I cannot at all uh, understand it and uh, explain it in any way because this, these are not just uh, uh, mercenaries or some kind of, uh, these are regular troops of Russian army that are doing this. And uh, this is very difficult to explain why they do this except that they want to, to break our spirit and break our people and break the support of our armed forces and that we surrender. And I think it's important to share this. I know it's terrifying. I know it's uh, difficult to, but like, uh, like two and a half weeks ago, we had a normal life. We did not do anything to provoke Russian Federation to attack us, except that we are free, a democratic country. We change our presidents every five years. I think this is okay. This is not a reason to do this to us. And uh, however, we are not victims uh, in this war. We don't want to be victims. We want to be fighting for our country and our armed forces are fighting for our country. We will not give up. It is important to understand that the spirit of our people is very strong. What we need, we do not need anyone to fight instead of us. We do not need that. We do not ask for that. What we do need is, is uh, help uh, with some supplies that are not something absolutely extraordinary. And uh, we actually need uh, the world to react on what Russian Federation is doing. They have 70% of their population supporting this, uh, this violence. This is, uh, this is not just Mr. Putin's war. It's important to understand that and to act on it. Thank you, Ruslan. Uh, <clears throat> Ruslan, if I can follow up your remarks with a um, question, I guess, addressed to both uh, you and Natan. Um, you, you just mentioned 70% of Russians are supporting the war, um, but we know, and we know that a good reason for that is propaganda. And we know that Vladimir Putin has made a point of weaponizing history in his favor. The essay that he published last summer on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, uh, he wrote it in it that, I'm quoting now, to have a better understanding of the present and to look into the future, we need to turn to history. His version of history is, of course, nothing but lies and distortion. But can you, and perhaps Natan as well, give us a little bit of the picture from your own personal perspectives of the lead up to this situation, how we got to this point where this action could take place um, as, as the world has just watched. Maybe Thank not. you. First of all, do you hear me? Because I had to move on my phone. Do you hear me well? Yes, we do. 
Okay. So, uh, of course, it's an extremely tragic situation. I, I was born in Donetsk, uh, which is in the heart of the war. I grew there for 18 years. I remember that the bi- one of the biggest celebrations in my childhood was in 1954, this so 300 years of volunteer Ukrainian joining of Russian empire. Of course, it took me a few years when I joined human rights movement to hear from my Ukrainian friends uh, that in fact it was kind of in slavery of, uh, uh, of Ukraine then. Uh, but uh, do you hear me? We, we hear you, but we don't see you. If you can turn on your camera, Mr. Sharansky. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Mr. Yeah. now we can okay. see you and hear you. But, okay. So, uh, uh, then the three, 30 years ago, Soviet Union fell apart. And in spite of all the efforts of the Soviet authorities uh, to erase the identities, to the, the national and religious identities, that was the idea of uh, Soviet Union that everybody has to become loyal only to communist ideology. Nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, the moment Soviet Union fell apart, people started rushing back to their identities. And uh, uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslims, uh, Ukrainians, Armenians, everybody wanted to live in accordance with their national and religious identity. And so uh, Ukraine became independent. I will say that uh, President Putin, when uh, in the first years of his rule, when I was meeting him, was obsessed how to get recognition of the bigger world. He was very upset that Russia is not a super power anymore. Uh, he, uh, and he wanted to get recognition from President Bush, from uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel. But after 20 years of being uh, the leader of Russia. Probably it's not good for anybody to be for so, so long the leader of the country, but after 20 years of being the leader and guaranteeing that he can be the leader all his life, he feels very strongly that he is the only really important leader in this world. He's the only one who stays on the board when the others are replacing one another and disappearing. And he, and he has a mission. He openly says that the biggest tragedy of the 20th century is the falling of Soviet uh, Union, falling apart. And he believes that it is his mission to restore uh, not Soviet Russia, because he doesn't believe in communism, but in fact, uh, Tsarist Empire, the, the Russian Empire, which was built by Russian Tsars and Ekaterina the Great and Peter the Great, are all his heroes. And so he started this process like 12 years ago, uh, war with Georgia, war, before this war in Chechnya, uh, control of Belarus, And then he started with Ukraine. It was clear that Ukraine is a critical point uh, in rebuilding this empire. And just before going to this war, he declared that Ukraine is not a nation, that Ukraine is not people, it's all part of Russia. In fact, the irony is that he now made more to mobilize Ukrainians as one nation and to bring them at the center of the history uh, than anybody else in the history. I I think never before Ukraine was playing such an important, inspiring role in the struggle of evil against good. And uh, yeah, we have all to understand it's not a war for some piece of land in Ukraine. It's even not the war between Russia and Ukraine. It's the war between ruthless dictatorship and free world. And it is a threat to all the free world. Just today I was speaking with one of my old friends from St. Petersburg who was dissident 35 years ago. And of course he's critical thinking today. And he said, look, there was a slow, developing coup for the last 10 years. Now it's finished. It's real coup and now it's real dictatorship. So that is the situation at this moment. 
Thank you. Ruslan, would you like to respond? Yes, sure. Uh, well, I definitely uh, share uh, everything Natal just said. And um, I can only add to that that this is not something coming out of the blue, um, that uh, this is a long-term policy of uh, Russian Federation. And uh, we had uh, basically 2008 uh, war against Georgia invasion into this country. And um, there was a strong reaction from the United States uh, when President Bush, Bush basically landed uh, planes of uh, the United States in Tbilisi uh, airport, and that stopped the war. And, um, and uh, in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea from uh, Ukraine, uh, was also a quite a, quite a serious uh, uh, warning. Uh, and I think that if uh, the world does not understand this warning right now in 2022, I, 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 I must say this, that nobody wants this, but Ukraine will not be the last to be attacked in Europe. I am definitely sure that Moldova will be attacked almost 100% that all Baltic states will be attacked. Not on, please mute your, one of your devices. And uh, no, I came back to normal internet, sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. So the Baltic states definitely will be attacked. And there are many ways to attack them that would be difficult to understand when the NATO should intervene. Poland is, uh, is terrified what's happening on their western border. 20 kilometers from Polish border today were hit, hit with rocket hits. It's very close. And uh, NATO did not make uh, any serious uh, response to that yet. We must understand that what Putin is doing, he's raising it every time and putting it further and further. And weak reaction or no reaction or reaction to keep things uh, business as usual led to this tragedy and it will lead to much bigger tragedy, I am afraid. So it is important to actually react in a way that will stop this war. And there are many ways, non-military, that can stop this war within days, within days. Thank you, thank you. Um, Mr. Sharansky, uh, in your book, uh, Fear No Evil, which I read as a student, you described your travails, your experiences uh, in the Soviet cage, in, in, in Soviet incarceration. Uh, you would probably be the best person I can think of to describe and compare for us the old Soviet uh, dictatorship um, that of the 1970s, the 1980s, the years of stagnation, um, and, and Putin's Russia and the um, um, autocratic authoritarian regime that we have seen rising um, in Russia since uh, slowly, gradually since the year 2000. Um, how do you compare them? No, if you would ask me three weeks ago, and I was asking these questions many times, of course, I will, I will tell you, yes, there is deterioration. The situation is much worse than it was five years ago, 15 years ago. But don't be mistaken, it's not Soviet Union because it is impossible to isolate people the way we were isolated in the Soviet uh, Union. It's impossible to control people by fear the way Soviet Union controlled because after all, the Soviet authorities killed millions and millions of people in order to control the others by fear. Uh, and there is no millions of people working as informers, as it was in the Soviet Union. Today, I would be very hesitant to say that it's not exactly the Soviet Union, because some people, dissidents of those days, tell me that situation is even worse. And what I mean, first of all, uh, informal freedom of contact with the outer world was a very important thing that Soviet Union closed the borders, and it, uh, there, was, there was no internet, there were no satellite TV, and uh, the communication itself with the outer world was a big problem. But what happened really in the last week, practically 10, 10 days, that uh, all the, uh, you cannot watch now in, in Moscow on TV, CNN or Fox or any other foreign TV. Uh, Facebook suddenly disappears. 
all the connections through internet disappear. The only thing which still keeps is Telegram. And who knows how long it will uh, continue working. More than this, uh, yeah, and by the way, and, uh, most of the Russian people who don't, don't make special effort to reach the West don't know that there is a war. They think there is a small group of Russian soldiers sent to help to the poor refugees from the bus. Nothing about bombarding the cities. When you call to somebody and start telling him, he doesn't want to believe you that that's something what's happening. Uh, now, there is a new law just 10 years ago, uh, days passed uh, in Russia, that those who are publishing fake news about our military in this moment can be punished up to 15 years of imprisonment. You have to understand, if people go on demonstration and say, stop the war, they can be arrested and accused in fake news because there is no war. There is special uh, operation. Some priest in St. Petersburg is giving prayer and calling to stop the war. He, by this law, can be sentenced to many years in prison. That are the changes which are happening in the last days. Uh, uh, still, I, I would say, we don't have this type of massive, uh, uh, huge gulag where practically everybody in the Soviet Union knew that he could disappear any moment of the block. We are not still there, but we are definitely uh, on the way there. And fear, uh, fear is coming back to the people. I speak to many on the phone. People start being afraid to speak on international phone and expressing their attitude to Russian government. I, I remember it only from the, from the many years ago. Uh, the only different thing is still that people can still leave. You know, all our struggle of Soviet Jews was that we couldn't leave to Israel. Uh, it's still possible to, uh, it's uh, uh, not so many countries where you can physically go, but technically at this moment, uh, there is no rest ban for Russian citizens to leave. And I have to say, most of my dissident Russian friends uh, who were who still living still there in the last 10 days left Russia. So it's all very uh, uh, alarming thing. And the only way that we can help is to break this uh, new iron curtain, which is established at the same time to show that at least we free world are not afraid of Putin's threats. We are challenging Putin's threats. We are challenging his uh, military activity. We are not afraid that he's blackmailing the world with a nuclear war. As long as he is the only one in the world who is ready to use this threat of nuclear war, there is no control. He, it must be showed very quickly, quickly that the free world is much more powerful and is not buying his threats. Thank you. Ruslan, I was hoping that perhaps you could talk. We now heard over a year ago about the plans for the Babin Yar Memorial Center and the expansion. Some of it are calling it potentially what will be the world's largest memorial center when it's built. It's on 320 acres of land. Um, but we also heard two weeks ago that Russian missile strikes um, landed close to uh, the site. So can you talk both about that, the current state of the Memorial Center, um, but then also just the, the project as a whole, what are the plans moving forward given uh, the war, but it is such a unique concept with an open air uh, Memorial Center and museums and research centers. So can you also just share with those of us who aren't familiar about the project as a whole? Sure, uh, well, Babinyar is, is quite a big territory. It's 130 hectares and um, uh, most of it looks like uh, either wooden area now or a park because Soviet Union tried to erase the memory about this uh, this place and um, and uh, what happened there. And our job uh, as a memorial uh, was to reestablish this memory and um, and uh, build number of museums and a number of artistic installations using not only uh, museums, but also uh, art as a language to speak to new generations and uh, also technology. 
we've uh, created as a first step a symbolic synagogue uh, uh, in the form of an opening book that uh, is 12 meters high and it opens and closes. And it's a very beautiful uh, architecture um, uh, building. And um, the next was um, creating a memorial with the names of the victims that we have discovered. We have now discovered more than 28,000 uh, names of the victims. And, um, and we had uh, installation uh, that was shot through with the same bullets uh, as, as uh, the caliber uh, of the bullets used by Germans to kill victims. And, uh, and it's a huge uh, 40 meters uh, wide mirror field that reflects sky and everything. And, uh, and uh, there's audio installation pronouncing names of the victims, women names with women, women voices and uh, children's names with child voices. And, and uh, even if we don't know the name, we just uh, would hear that, uh, you know, infant six months old. And uh, every time it's a very moving, very emotional, powerful memorial. Uh, and um, actually um, uh, a week ago, um, there was a uh, missile uh, attack at the uh, TV tower that is uh, located in the Babanyar. And um, the guy uh, who was correcting the fire, he was standing at the mirror field. And our security saw him because not, um, uh, and, uh, and they, they, uh, they caught him and they gave him the, back to the security service. But uh, they still hit uh, the tower and they hit also closer from the tower the sports center building that is not being used, we plan to use it as, a, as part of the Holocaust Memorial uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, it hits 10 meters from the building of uh, office of a former Jewish cemetery. We already have the architecture solution for that uh, uh, done together with the Madrid uh, uh, based um, of Pauline uh, architecture agency. And we wanted to already start, uh, start works uh, this year in this area. So it actually uh, burnt down uh, the building of this, uh, uh, of this uh, former sport, sport complex. And um, we will, as we go back to Kyiv, as we will continue working on the memorial, we will not, I'm sure of that, we will not uh, erase this, this burnt down building. We will not just uh, take it off and build something new there. We will not do it. We will keep it the way it is because it's also uh, now part of the memory of Babanyar. Uh, I want to add a few words, if I may. Of course, Ruslan is the best person to speak about the museum, but I want to say how symbolic it is. Babanyar is not only the symbol of the Holocaust by bullets because it is the biggest mass grave of the Holocaust. Uh, 100,000 people are in that grave, 34,000 were killed in two days, took fr from the apartments in Kyiv, brought there, stripped, and killed one by one. But Babi Yara is also the symbol of the efforts of Soviet Union to destroy the memory about Holocaust. Uh, they tried to turn it into the biggest set of wastewater from Kyiv, officially. And it brought to awful tragedy, by the way. There was a flood and 1,500 uh, citizens of Kyiv uh, were drowned. And then they decided to turn into the biggest sports complex. That's why this is one of the remnants of that big, huge sports complex, which was built there. And it, by accident, there was TV station. All the time they were inventing how to make sure that it will be forgotten. And, in my childhood, it was like secret word, Babi Yar. So when there was a poem of Ivtushenko, Babi Yar, for one day, there was like a celebration among Jews. I was a small boy and my parents were so glad that finally we can speak about the tragedy. And next day it was all prohibited. And then Shostakovich wrote music. There was one co concert and it was prohibited. So now we want more, no, no more, no less, this biggest symbol of Holocaust and efforts to raise Holocaust to turn into the biggest museum in Europe of Holocaust. And so how symbolic was it? On the 80th anniversary, only, only a few months ago, the Berlin Orchestra came to that place and played uh, Shostakovich music 
and the reverses of Gennady Tushenko in the presence of the president of Ukraine, president of Germany, and president of Israel. And, uh, and of course, the synagogue, there was a special service, and uh, there were the plans how it would be turned into the biggest uh, Holocaust uh, museum. So, a few months after this, the war, war happened. President Zelensky, who was the big supporter and uh, we cooperated very close on this project, became also, I think, now the, the example for the world of mobilization and not giving up to, to, uh, to the evil. Uh, and uh, well, we hope uh, Ruslan can take, say more, but how we really we created the families of all the workers there, but we continue even now there to do whatever assistance we can do to, to the families of survivors, to the families of the decay of Mod the, um, the the writers, their children and grandchildren. Uh, uh, they saved Jews, we are trying to help them. And we are, of course, waiting for the time when we can continue this project. Before we move on, I would like to, th thank you, Mr. Sharansky. Before we move on, I would like to uh, um, invite uh, our audience, the over 1,200 people, or close to 1,200 people who are now joining us live on uh, YouTube Live to share their questions in the chat. And by the end of the discussion, we'll be able to uh, take a couple of questions. Now we can continue. Uh, not that if I can just pick up from where you left off, it was, uh, I actually saw what you were talking about directly firsthand in the late 1970s, when mm -hmm. I think we talked about this once, I was on a mission to bring uh, Jewish material to Soviet, uh, to refuseniks in the Soviet Union and visited uh, Kiev firsthand and saw that the inscription was very generic. Here lie victims of fascism with no identifying factor other than that small plaque and, and, and small monument. And even the taxi drivers refused to take me there. We had to find a way to get there on our own. So the, the, this attempt to use history is nothing new. Um, one of the tricks that's being used by Putin and his supporters, of course, as we all know, is to attempt to justify the uh, invasion um, as, a, as a form of denazification of Ukraine. <laughs> And in doing that, they draw upon an unfortunate, um, and as we know, a terrible in many cases, history of anti-Semitism in Ukraine. And more recently, um, uh, incidences such as the Azov Battalion, which was the uh, extreme, uh, which had links to extreme uh, right-wing groups, including American and uh, other neo-Nazi groups that have been linked to murders, the uh, continued adulation for Stepan Bandera, the OUNB leader during the war, whose uh, followers uh, ethnically cleansed uh, hundreds of thousands of Poles and murdered thousands of Jews. Um, the so-called Rada Law of 2015, the, and other government actions that legitimize the OUNB. And these have become the pretext um, because Putin is following that, that familiar maxim of that the best lies are built on a grain of truth. And in doing that, he's trying to tap into um, these historical fears and, and suspicions. How would you address these and just point out how the circumstance in Ukraine is very different or is moving away from that historical legacy. And Ruslan, I guess from your perspective, we'll be, uh, be interested in hearing that as well. Well, uh, the, the, the arguments of Putin, I would say they are absolutely laughable, but it's not, uh, it's not laugh, it's tragedy. Uh, and by the way, I don't think that he brought these arguments hoping that anybody in the West will believe in it. He brought this argument simply to say something to his own people. That is what propaganda in Russia now is saying, that we went there because it is a puppet American pro-Nazi regime, which was going to attack us, and we attacked them before they attacked us. That's more or less what said. Uh, there is nothing to say. It's absolute nonsense. Now, as to anti-Semitism today, I have to make it clear, neither in Ukraine, no, in Russia, in the last 30 years, there was any state anti Semitism. And uh, Ru Russian leaders uh, in the last years tried to encourage us many times to condemn anti Semitism in Ukraine. There is not, no, no, no state anti Semitism, neither in Russia nor in Ukraine. Prejudice 
is maybe there are, but when you live in democratic society and Ukraine is extremely democratic, we can complain about corruption, we can complain about instability of the governments, about weakness of social institutions, but it's extremely open democratic society, which every few years shows, demonstrates how the will of people prevails all the time. And in a democratic society, in the free society, when the government is not encouraging any anti-Semitism, to the contrary, when the Jewish communities can prosper and have free connection with the Jewish communities in the world, and of course, uh, with Israel, uh, uh, the, the, there is no threat to, to this. Now, of course, there were very difficult moments of history in the past, by the way, in Ukraine, but also in Russia, of course. I don't have to, to remind people about state anti-Semitism in Russia or about pogroms uh, in Ukraine. But when I hear the voices these days, well, uh, they were so bad for Jews, we now have, it should not be good for them. It's such a ridiculous anti-Jewish, anti-human statement. I have to say, Ukrainian people in the last 30 years did a lot to overcome the most difficult pages of their history. And Ukrainian people did something which almost no other country did. They voted in personal votes, popular ballot, the president who is openly, proudly Jewish. And, and uh, that, that does stop him from being proud citizen uh, of Ukraine and the leader of Ukraine. So uh, these accusations are ridiculous. They have no connection to the reality. And uh, I think, it, I would not say it's our moral obligation. It's our deep interest, deep interest as people of the free world and as Jews to defend uh, Ukraine, to be on the side of Ukraine and together with Ukrainian people to build together our the future, which is built fully on recognition of the tragedies of the past. So, Mr. Sharansky, um, Illinois. But maybe the slide wants to add something. I'm sorry. Uh, so, Illinois Holocaust Museum. So, the Chicagoland area where the museum is, we have around 4,000 survivors of the Holocaust that still live here. Um, well over 90% actually represent survivors from the former Soviet occupied territories. And recently, our museum undertook a major augmentation and expansion of our core exhibition to talk about particularly the story of um, our community, uh, Operation Exodus, and the story of the Refuseniks. As a former Refusenik, prisoner of Zion, and a human rights activist, how do you um, assess the gravity of the situation for the Jews of Ukraine? Ruslan mentioned, I think that we can all agree that this isn't going to stop. We, we might see this move into Moldova or the Balkans. How do you see this impacting the Jewish community uh, in the area? And Ruslan, maybe you can speak to that as well. Well, uh, Ruslan can maybe speak more about physical situation. I can say that uh, there are, uh, first of all, there are, uh, the country is not similar to the fire. There is systematic attempt to destroy the most beautiful, cities in, uh, in the Eastern Europe. It was systematic to destroy all of them. That's such a big crime against humanity. And together with the people who live in this house, and even refugees, and there are two and a half million refugees already more every few, few hundred thousands every day. And sometimes refugees, when they are on their way out, are killed by, uh, by the shooting. Uh, there is a community of well, uh, approximately uh, 200,000, uh, as we say, legitimate, uh, eligible under the law of return, Jews and their families uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the, almost all these communities are now in the state, situation of evacuation. Uh, of course, Jewish agency is doing a big work of uh, accompanying practically everybody, helping them to reach the border and then taking care of them, but uh, uh, practically all the refugees now there need uh, help. Uh, and that's why the opportunities for the world to help to the refugees are very big. But the thing is also how to stop this awful process 
of every day there are another two, three hundred thousand refugees. Every day another city is destroyed or erased uh, uh, from this world. And uh, I, don't, I don't think Europe faced anything like this since the Second uh, World War. And uh, uh, the world has to, uh, not to discuss uh, what shall we do after uh, Putin will finish with Ukraine. We have to, to mobilize now. It's, uh, it's, well, I can't even imagine what a catastrophe for all the free world is thinking about the gold without Ukraine. And now let's think what we'll do next. That's the best proof, by the way, for the dictator that his way of uh, 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 launching the war by, by blackmailing uh, the world uh, is working. So uh, I, I think uh, the emergencies, that is an emergency situation, and we have to, to think what we didn't do up till now, what else we can do immediately. Uh, Ruslan, you want to? No, I can only add that um, I, I don't think uh, our enemy expected that our Jewish president uh, will be the best Ukrainian leader I think we ever had and uh, that he will stand and that uh, he is number one uh, target. There are hit groups uh, all over Kyiv uh, that they sent from Chechnya, from uh, Wagner group. They are military criminals and uh, they are sent to kill him. And, uh, and he stands his ground and uh, we all stand by him. And uh, it is important to, to, again to understand that um, we will not surrender. This will go on and it will be much more worse if uh, people will think that uh, business as usual will continue. This is not going to happen. And um, it, it is highly important to understand that. It is important to act. And unfortunately, uh, that action is, um, is welcoming uh, the aggressor. They're welcoming the sanctions they've received. They're welcoming it and showing it that they are ready to use even more force. And now they discuss the chemical weapons. How many civilian women and children should die from this so that then any serious sanctions should be imposed? Not half measures. That we will sanction this bank, but not the spare bank, not the biggest bank. We will sanction that tiny bank, but we will keep buying everything from them. We will say we stop this, but then we have all the supplies they need going with uh, trucks and railways. So we do not fly, but we, we, we send it the other way around. So this is, does not look like a real uh, values. It, 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 proves, it proves that, you know, not enough is being done. This war can be stopped in two days. If there would be a saying that, you know, look, if you hit tomorrow any city with a bomb, your gas doesn't, is not being bought on that day. Your gas and oil are not being bought at all that day. Any day you shoot, any day we don't sell, we don't buy. That's a simple action that can stop it in days. They are not ready to face it. And because there is no, and there are many other ways. And because there is not enough action. And, and unfortunately, we have more civilian victims than military ones. In Mariupol only, we have 2,200 people killed, civilians. And in all Ukraine, we have 1,300 military killed. You must understand in Kharkiv, in Kyiv, in Irpin, Hostomel and Bucha, where I come from, thousands and thousands of civilians are being killed every day. Like yesterday, there was also a request from a, a girl that was, uh, her stepdad was killed and, uh, and uh, 
And she was wounded and her mother couldn't get her out because they wouldn't allow her to go out. And the child is dying slowly because she can't get medical, any, any help. And this kind of behavior, I don't know how, uh, how the Western countries can look at this and not act. Because imposing sanctions on the member of parliament of, of Russia and not imposing sanctions on all the people who work in the military, uh, a ministry of defense of Russia, all the people who work in the FSB, all the people who work in other uh, uh, ministries that work to supply this war. And there are many other ways to press them. And they laugh at it because they say, okay, we go to Europe through Serbia. Or we go to, you know, to vacations on the other side of the other country. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. They just laugh on it. They just laugh on it. And thank you. Um, I would like to, to apologize for doing so, to apologize for now drawing you from these uh, awful descriptions of the war, the atrocities, the figures that you just mentioned. Let me also uh, make an editorial comment that we are still ready to receive more questions from our audience, if you would like to share it in the chat. So, Ruslan, um, I wanted to talk uh, for a moment about uh, your journey and go back um, go back to Babin Yar. Um, Babin Yar, or Babi Yar, as it is known in Russia, is a place uh, of conflicting narratives, conflict, conflicting histories. Uh, Mr. Sharansky just said before that with all likelihood, this war is not so much about um, ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians fighting, but rather a fight between a, a ruthless dictator and the free world. But if we go to Babi, to, to Babi or Babin Yar, I would like to hear a little bit about your personal story. Um, what you knew about the Holocaust um, before uh, you came to um, take a leadership position in, in the center, and I'm also curious, we know that Jews and Ukrainians in particular do not um, view the war, World War II, the Holocaust, the same way they each have their own national narrative. Babin Yar sometimes becomes a, a focal point for these conflicting stories and narratives, perspectives. And I'm wondering to what degree will the center, the Babin Yar Memorial Center, constitute a bridge to connect and reconcile between these two communities and different voices. Yes, and <clears throat> I think uh, for me personally, it was a uh, one of the biggest reasons I uh, joined the leadership of, uh, of uh, Memorial, because I believe it is uh, of major importance for Ukraine uh, to uh, tell this story in its full uh, and uh, understand the whole story of Holocaust. Uh, on the territory of Ukraine, uh, 1,500,000 Jews were killed on the current territory of Ukraine. And uh, I don't think that's, uh, uh, that's uh, understood enough, what happened and how it happened. And uh, we can um, do uh, and... Of course, uh, not only the territory of Ukraine, the, the Eastern Europe, uh, the, the territory of Eastern Europe that includes Baltic states, Belarus, part of Russia, Moldova, uh, two and a half million Jews were killed, like in Babin Yar, shot next to their homes, not led to any uh, concentration camps, not led to uh, ghettos, but killed next to their homes in the daylight when their neighbors could see it and saw it. And um, this story is, is uh, for me personally, is uh, of tremendously important that we tell it. That's why our team, you must understand that most of our team is not Jewish, only a couple of people. We're all Ukrainian and uh, mainly young, younger generation. Uh, and uh, and uh, for us, uh, it's... Um, uh, it's it's something that uh, needs to be needs to be resolved, and all these narratives that are conflicting, we feel it on ourselves as well. We have tremendous criticism uh, on us, with very different narratives around uh, our memorial. But 
it is important to, to, to continue this work. Last year uh, on the 80th anniversary, we actually started delivering. Uh, we had the first uh, groups, uh, group of uh, killers announced with their names because these were not, uh, you know, unnamed uh, and anonymous people. In Babanyar, yes, mainly they were German. Locals were used uh, for uh, secondary roles, but they were there, local people participating. And in other places, like in Bila Cerca, there were locals uh, that were uh, primarily uh, participating. And uh, from my perspective, uh, that, that should be clear and that should be uh, absolutely clear to everyone. And uh, the names of those people, I don't think they should be secret. I don't think uh, any of them are our heroes. They are not our heroes. They are not our heroes. The righteous among our na the nations are our heroes. These are the people that we want to be. And we celebrate that. Actually, we opened the synagogue on the day of righteous among the nations that our president established last year. And we want to celebrate these kind of, uh, these kind of actions. And we want to be sure that, you know, this, uh, this, uh, these words never again, they mean something and we act on it. We act on it. And I think that Ukraine is uh, coping a lot better with, uh, with our past than for instance, Russia, if we speak about Ukraine, Russia, because in Russia, if you say something about collaborators, and there were many, uh, there was a whole army of uh, collaborators. If you say it, you get to jail. They have a law. And we have a new law that forbids anti-Semitism. You get to jail for that. So this is a very different paths we have. It is a very different uh, road that we take, Ukraine and Russia. Our societies go very different roads. It's important. Thank you. Thank you, Ruslan. Since we are uh, running out of time, I, um, I just want to thank, first of all, the two of you, Mr. Sharansky and Mr. Kavatsuk. I think we all learned so much over the last three weeks. And also, I can say personally f from you, Ruslan, um, not only about uh, the situation and the war right now in Ukraine, but really about these tremendous uh, changes that uh, happened in your country and the rise of a new generation that really brings us hope that uh, we can look um, into a better future and, and the hope that this terrible war comes to a swift end. Uh, I wanted now to um, uh, take a couple of questions from the audience. One of them has to do with the response of um, countries around the world in general and Israel in particular. So maybe that would be a question for Nathan and then for Ruslan. Um, about uh, the effort to um, to help refugees, to to absorb them, to help them to find refuge while this situation is still going on. Uh, well, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, solidarity in Israel towards Ukraine. I can say that uh, even my daughter, with my grandchildren, uh, went on the demonstrations with. Uh, Ukrainian flags on the demonstration, the children found out that they put the colors in different order, but uh, that's correction of their way. And there is a lot of assist material assistance and uh, there are big uh, groups which have participated like Ratsala who moved to the borders of the four countries bordering with Ukraine and raising money all the time from Israelis for for every operation. And there are small groups, some uh, organized by those who came from the former Soviet Union, who uh, like organizing almost like uh, a special international organization of uh, paying for the buses, which are taking refugees from different cities of Ukraine and bringing them to the border. Uh, and, uh, and Israel the government of course sent already four or five uh, airplanes of such assistance. Uh, having said all this, there is a criticism, and I am one of those who, who criticizing our, our government for not being ready to give defensive weapons to Ukraine. It's a painful question for Israel because, because mainly of the weakness of the West, we became dependent 
on President Putin in attacking the bases of Iran and Syria. I will not go to all the history. I wrote about it in my recent article in the Wall Street Journal, but there is a lot of it. But whoever has to be blamed for this, uh, we are dependent, and that's why our authorities are very cautious uh, in undermining this balance and continuing to keep some uh, constructive relations with Putin. I, I personally believe that the war is too deep, is too uh, metaphysical proportions. It's uh, between good and evil for the future existence of the free world. And we as a part of this free world should put aside all, all, all our uh, reservations. But, uh, well, uh, but I have to say solidarity. Well, the polls show that uh, like 78% of Israelis fully support Ukraine. And, but it's interesting that like 8% believe to Putin. You will be surprised who can believe to Putin. But when we call now to, or many of us who call to our, uh, to our friends or friends who were 30 years ago to some cities in Russia, they find out that uh, propaganda is working. And in the last two weeks, there were many friendships which was, was simply broken because Israelis, former, Israel, former Soviet Union, cannot accept these lies. Uh, so in Israel, these lies are not working. But we have to know that in Russia, it is working, and so we'll have a lot of work to do. Thank you. A uh, question to Ruslan is about if you can elaborate a little bit about um, how we can help um, via non-military um, non -milita non -military ways. Well, a uh, very good example of that is, uh, for instance, Poland. Um, um, we can see how uh, in Poland, many uh, Ukrainians um, found their uh, uh, shelter and um, it is uh, it is a very very important action during these uh, terrible times we see that uh, there is a supply uh, chain established from Poland and of course uh, we understand that um, that um, if um, there is anyone um, able to write a letter to talk to people in power in uh, your countries to let them know that it's important to support Ukraine and uh, support more, much more. That I understand that in Russia it doesn't work, but in uh, in Western democracies it does. The politicians listen to people; or they act on it if there are enough people speaking about it. It's also important uh, for leaders and uh, of uh, public opinion. Uh, for universities to, to, to speak out and say that, um, of course, it is nonsense uh, and it's clear, but it is important to understand and speak that, uh, you know, Ukraine led by Jewish president is not a Nazi country, that we are normal democracy that was attacked and that the truth is different. So that Russian propaganda, it, it, it has some audience in, in the West, and it's important to be united around the truth. And, um, and I think also it's highly important to, um, to put pressure on the aggressor. Uh, and, it, and it's important to, to um, even the grassroots movement right now in Poland, you would see that local people, they block roads for the uh, vans uh, taking goods to Belarus and uh, Russia. So even these kind of actions, they make governments act different. Uh, there are different ways. Um, and uh, and uh, of course, um, there are many ways to support different people uh, in Ukraine and uh, people who moved out. Like, um, of course, I, uh, I, I would also say that uh, it's heavily important to support uh, defense of Kyiv uh, in, in many different ways, because there are many people and uh, people like in Mariupol, be ready to, to, to support them, because at a certain point of time, we will take them out of there and they are very, very wounded uh, and uh, they need help. So 
I, I, I share what Nathan is saying, the whole world, if we don't want this uh, to spread and to be much more worse, we should unite and uh, help the people. Let's not help some, some abstract uh, Ukrainians. Let's help the people that are there who have names, especially the weak ones, especially those who can't uh, take care of themselves. Holocaust education, we always talk about one multiplied by six million. Thank you, Ruslan. Nathan, uh, do you have um, any um, concluding remark before we have to uh, wrap up this program? No, well, in fact, I can only uh, finish with what uh, with uh, what uh, Ari started, our president. Uh, well, he said that because uh, in the words of Mordechai had said, uh, somebody to said that maybe for this moment you came to the past. So, uh, and where of me are thinking, what is the moment for which we exist now? For which, and I have to say that uh, it's unique moment for the free world and for us, and of course Jew Jewish people who are well, uh, I would say very dynamical and central part of this free goal. Uh, that is a moment of unique test, which we are all going through. Uh, and uh, uh, it will say then uh, through all the rest of your life, you're c coming back to that moment and think whether you failed or you succeeded. And if, if you failed, it will influence on all your future life. And if you succeed, it also will help you in all your future life. I'm speaking from my past experience, and I think it's very appropriate to speak about it today. Thank you. I want to now to thank um, all of our participants on the panel. I would like to begin with uh, President uh, Ari Berman, the president of Yeshiva University. Thank you, President, for um, your uh, very powerful uh, opening remarks and for connecting um, the situation in Ukraine to both our Jewish lore and the Jewish calendar in a very powerful way. I also wanted to thank uh, Mr. Kavatsuk and Mr. Sharansky for their time. I wanted to thank uh, my uh, fellow interviewer, um, Ms. Kelly Zaini and Mar Mr. Mark Weitzman for participating on the panel. Um, seems like uh, our time is up on behalf of all of the participants on this call and the many more who are joining me from their homes and watch our program right now. I would like to conclude the program expressing a hope and prayer that you and your family, colleagues and countrymen and women will be safe and that this terrible world would come to a swift end. A recording of this program will be available shortly, right after we finish. I wanted to also thank um, the Babinia Memorial Center as well as our sponsors for this event. We mentioned them at the beginning of the, the program, um, the Association of Holocaust Organizations, Jewish Gen, and uh, uh, the uh, Museum uh, of uh, Jewish Heritage, a live memorial to the Holocaust in New York City. In addition to the sponsors mentioned earlier, we have a list of community partners that helped us promote this program. I would like to now thank the Holocaust and Human Rights Center in White Plains, New York, the Center of Holocaust Education at East Valley uh, in Arizona, the 3GNY, the Florida Holocaust Museum, the R Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program for International Affairs at Yeshiva University, Shadow Light, Manhattan College Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Education Center, the San Antonio Holocaust Museum, Sasua 75, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, University of Miami, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, and the, the Holocaust Education Center in Fukuyama, Japan, the Sister Rose Thering Fund for Education in Jewish Christian Studies, the Lake District Holocaust Project, Jewish Gen, uh, and the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Research Center, and, and lastly, in Milwaukee, and lastly, the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. As you can see, there were many uh, partners who wanted to uh, join this program and share it with their constituents, recognizing how important it is that when we teach history and draw its lessons, we are also focused on what's happening in the present and see how we can take action. I also wanted to thank those who helped us to pull off 
on a very short notice, this very complicated uh, production, to thank Sima Gil Vaknin. She's a founding member of Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, and is also, she's also the founder of Strategic, strategic Influence. And um, uh, Sima uh, worked with me uh, earlier and connected us uh, with our participants, as she's a strategic advisor to the Babini Yar Memorial Center. I also to, wanted to thank uh, on my team, on the Fish Center team, to thank Lois Roman and Hodaya Blau uh, for helping us uh, to uh, coordinate this event and all of our colleagues at Yeshiva University. I'm actually calling you from campus right now who are busy this morning to facilitate this call. I hope that you uh, continue to tune into our events and uh, let's uh, conclude with a prayer that Ruslan, you, your family, your colleagues at the Babinyar Memorial Center, your countrymen and women will all be safe. And we'll do, what I hope we stay in touch. We will certainly do all that we can to stop this terrible war. Thank you for being with us.